We are live and welcome back to the latest in our series of reviewer credits ask us anything events fantastic great to see you if you're joining us on linkedin great you can comment you can engage with this event by putting comments into the comments section on linkedin which would be absolutely fantastic today we're joined as always by my dear friend maria machado maria how are you doing today everything okay i'm good it's really hot in here Oh, whoops. Okay. Well, today we're talking about what could be quite a controversial topic. So we're going to try to keep it clean. We're going to try to keep it as even and informative as possible. But many people, I'm sure, may have comments, may have questions, may have things that they want to ask about the topic of peer review of conference content. Right, Maria, you've been like I have to lots of academic conferences Tell us a little bit about some of your experiences submitting to conferences. Did that content get peer reviewed, do you think? So um, my experience is that even in smaller uh, national conferences, my abstracts would get peer reviewed uh, because I would get uh, comments back and then people um, asking whether I would like to have a poster presentation or if I wanted to apply for an oral presentation or uh, all of those things. But um, it's not very common that you get that much organization within smaller conferences. But I, right. I definitely, my experience was that I did, yes. Right, that, 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 that marries with my experience too. Um, but depending on the size, of the conference, the kind of society perhaps that was hosting the conference. I definitely went to a large number of big international meetings where, yes, peer review took place on the abstracts and also on the outcome on the conference um, proceedings in, in, in many cases. But what kind of peer review did you get, Maria? Was it, was it, you mentioned that you get comments back from people that you were aware of or were the comments blinded for the abstracts? Let's talk about the abstracts. No, 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 they were, uh, I knew who the people were and they were usually either the organizers of the conference, um, the people from the, the society that was organizing the conference, guest editors, or um, the people organizing the symposia within the bigger conference that were uh, reviewing the abstracts. So it, it seems that there's like a tiered system within conferences, whether it's a small conference, then you just have the conference organizers. Um, if it's a bigger conference that has lots of multiple um, uh, panels, then you have each panel organizer, moderator, doing their own peer review. I used to go to this big North American conference every year, and I'm afraid to say that sometimes I actually got my abstracts rejected sending them in to that conference, which is a bit shocking. But that's a good thing, right? Because that at least means that there's some effective quality control going on at the abstract submission peer review stage. Because in the case of this conference, the abstracts were published in the journal series. Now, this is a big society working with one of the major international publishers. So they publish six issues of regular papers every year and then there's a seventh special booklet special issue a supplement to one of the regular issues containing all of the conference abstracts which were in this particular case peer reviewed but we never knew in this example that i'm giving who the reviewers were so that was double blind but you mentioned maria that you you experienced the kind of open or single blinded yeah. peer review right Yes, so I knew because it, it was through conference organizers or through uh, symposium organizers that I would get an email saying, oh, could you add this or maybe um, focus on that? Because I would often uh, submit an abstract and they would want, uh, depending on the type of conference, sometimes people are looking forward to one specific part of your work. So people more interested in anatomy, people more interested in physiology would be more interested in learning about a, a facet of your 
of your project. So they would want something more um, specific. So they would request, kind of request that you focus more on that bit. And we're going to come back and talk about the use of abstracts and that peer review process in a little bit. But that's also good if you're submitting to a conference and the abstracts are going into an issue of the journal, because that also means, of course, that they can be cited. So one of the concerns that researchers often have about going to conferences and presenting their work at conferences is if it's not being peer reviewed, if it's not being published, if the abstracts aren't appearing in some way in a citable format, then you might get your work stolen or somebody might see you give that conference presentation and, and go off and repeat the study, which of course is deeply unethical, but it does happen. I yeah. can ask you, Maria, that's that. have you ever, ever come across a situation like that in your academic career? So I've come across situations where people were kind of replicating uh, portions of work from one another, but not so much in a competitive way, but more as in, I'm focusing on this section, can you get the same results that I'm getting in this bit of the work that's similar to ours? Um, I think it's a great way to, to get doubts, uh, methodological doubts and data, and they, doubts regarding data out of, out of the way. But um, there's also um, instances where people are not focusing on something and then they see your presentation and they say, oh, that, that would be cool and I have data to show this already, so maybe I could publish something. Um, that depends very much on the type of work that you do. For me, because the type of work that I was doing is always very time consuming. So it would be highly improbable that people got to the stage where I was at in my data, uh, gathering an analysis by the time that I was able to submit something for a publication. So. My field's the opposite. I mean, if you saw a paleontologist give a presentation, that would be fossil based or specimen based and or like ideas based. So you could quite easily that could that has that does unfortunately happen. And conferences, if you're listening to this and you'd like to share some of your own experiences with conference peer review, we'd love that. Let us know. Do you agree with what we've been saying before? Have you experienced single blind, double blind peer review of your conference abstracts? and articles or no peer review at all, because this is a bit of a gray area in the whole peer review process. And so we're working at Reviewer Credits and with partners to standardize some of the procedures around peer review for conferences, because sometimes there's no peer review happening at all. And that can be the case with smaller meetings, perhaps, as we've talked about, or, and, or, and this is a real problem as everybody is of course aware, the conference will be um, producing a special issue or one session at the conference will be producing a special issue. That's of great interest to publishers, of course, because that's a source for content, a source for papers that they wouldn't otherwise have had. And so what's happened, what happens, I got an email about this just yesterday because we all get emails on this topic all of the time. Publishers may turn over the peer review process or have turned over the peer review process to guest editors or society mm -hmm. representatives given control of the peer review process. And that, of course, has proven not to be sustainable. Do you want to say a few things quickly about that, Maria? So um, for me, it's been uh, um, always the case that if uh, guest editors are given control of the special issue that features the abstract or the extended abstract that you will need somebody else so that you will need a representative from the publisher and some sort of external peer review that wasn't uh, involved in organizing the conference because there is just from the mere fact that you're organizing something you are inviting people and you're inviting um, work that you find interesting. 
but for to present, right? So that you're organizing a, a symposia, you're going to invite people that whose work you find interesting. If you find it interesting, then you are less likely to be as objective as you could possibly be in your peer review process. So the, the, that's that's a bit of um because then conferences are prone to you know you network you get new collaborations you meet people that you haven't met before uh and you get ideas that you hadn't before so just from the mere fact that you attended the conference you can get some sort of uh implicit bias going on I, absolutely, I was involved in several, um, not a lot, but several special issues that were published around conference special sessions that I helped organize. And I must say, being honest with you, like I was given with my co-organizers of the session control over that peer review process by the publisher. And well, I mean, bias comes into it because the session was all about things that we were particularly interested in as as you've already yeah. mentioned, Maria, we knew all of the people in the yeah. session because we'd invited them to participate. Many of them were quite good friends of ours. My field is quite small, so I knew almost everybody in it. Anyway, that's not great in terms of objectivity in the peer review process. So working at another journal, we built up the journal's reputation in the early days by going to conferences and talking to conference organizers about publishing special sessions but we handled all of the peer review at the journal editorial office rather than giving any responsibility to the symposium organizers and we've got a workflow here on the slide that is kind of an ideal workflow for doing this like a session organizer would give a publisher a proposal for a special issue that would then get approved or not manuscript submissions come in to the publisher not to the symposium organizer and then i don't know if you agree with this maria we're going to just ask you in a moment should then be double blind peer reviewed i would argue because at a conference lots of you know papers in one particular topic area there's going to be lots of overlap potentially between the reviewers that might get asked and it's better i would argue that that's all done in a double blind way what do you think about that i think it's it's uh, actually much better because um also whenever you're you are going to ask someone to peer review a conference paper if that person happened to be at the conference and asked the question of the of the presenter then they have the answer they're probably not going to bother asking it again but if you are if you are in a way uh, if you have a double blind peer review process, then all of those questions and answers get recorded and you can go back to that correspondence and uh, look at all of the doubts that people had and all of the thought process. So conference peer review, some recommendations as it is an issue, a bit of a gray area. If you're thinking of attending a conference, perhaps you're a young researcher listening to this, watch out. I got an email on this very topic just the other day as well. We often get emails from um, journals inviting us to contribute to special issues. Conference special issues are included in that. Also, we get emails inviting us to attend conferences, often completely outside of our subject areas. That's a basic way that you can tell that this is probably a predatory conference. But, you know, basically speaking, one of the first steps to go through as a researcher when you get invited to a conference is to think, is this real or not? How can you tell, Maria? Some obvious <laughs> tells like you're a paleontologist like me and you get invited to a molecular genetics meeting. That would be, you know, something that I wouldn't really attend in my line of work. But what about you? You must have experienced this kind of thing also. Yes. <laughs> so um, sometimes you do get invitations because you were in a list of, I don't know how many authors in 20 something of a paper, and they get to you because you're closer in geography, but you're like, I don't know anything of what you're talking about in this specific field. But sometimes you do get completely unrelated. And I've had uh, people asking me to submit papers to conferences in economics. 
which is something I know nothing about. <laughs> but yeah, uh, like you do get people, you know, random emails to for people to get you to submit to chemistry of click chemistry. I I don't know weird and random, wonderful. Uh, <laughs> different kinds of things but usually <laughs> in very nice places <laughs> exactly right that's part of the hook often isn't it they get, get a trip to somewhere fantastic anyway there's some resources here for you if you're listening to this and you're needing some maybe some guidance next time you get an email from a random conference think check 10.org also have a look at the cope guidelines there on publication ethics Org. Very, very important to pick your conferences carefully. These are great networking opportunities if you go to conferences that are actually valuable for you in your research field. You can make sure that people get to know about your research and get your contents peer reviewed, hopefully. Quickly, there's possibilities usually at conferences to present orally posters as well as short conference papers often. And we've talked about some of the problems with those. If you're signed up on reviewer credits and you do a review for a journal or a publisher, we've got poster creation services in the reward center. So you can get discounts on some of the best poster creation services out there in the author services research solutions industry. Posters are just as good as talks, right, Maria? They're not like a second choice, as I always used to feel when I was a researcher. Uh, no, I think sometimes it just depends what stage you're in of your project. So um, at the very early stages of whatever project I was starting out, I always prefer to have a poster presentation because then you have more informal talks with people that come over um, and ask you to, to tell them what it is that you're going through. And you have different ideas that you can pick out and... Um, network and ask for uh, input. Oral presentations are more um, something that you need a lot of visuals to get across. So um, I would prefer to have um, oral presentations whenever I had videos, for instance. But that's because I'm old, right? Nowadays, you can have videos in your posters whenever you're they're digital and you just put them on a USB stick and stick them on somewhere. Yeah, or middle aged, as we keep calling each other in these events, right? <laughs> so if yes. you get if you do a poster at a conference and you're talking to people about your results, that's networking. And it's also a kind of peer review, right? Like you're participating in what is effectively open peer review, like standing next to your poster, talking about it with people or doing it online, presenting your poster in an online forum. That's open peer review. So it's going to hopefully have been peer reviewed maybe as an abstract before you send the conference that information at the start. So peer review happens at that stage. Then you're getting open peer review from your colleagues and peers at the conference itself. And it all helps for you to build towards that final publication step. And that final publication step, as a lot of people will talk about, is the step that gets evaluated by your institution, by your government, by your funding agency. But as we're learning, the research life cycle of that particular project is, is huge and long. And so we should be reporting on all different stages. Conferences and posters are a great way to do that, as well as pre-printing. And Maria... Yes. Uh, I know you're a big advocate of open science, open peer yeah. review and preprinting, but why is this a great idea if you're going to present your work at a conference? Because it gives you um, a stamp on your idea, on your concept, on what it is that you want to develop further. So um, if uh, starting out, for instance, my, one of my projects, one of my postdocs, I was developing a model. So that alone took a long time to develop an in vivo model for something that was about a year of my life. So within a year, I had very little to show for in terms of results, but I have done a lot of work in in getting in optimizing um, the model. And that resulted in uh, posters, that resulted in conference abstracts, that resulted in lots of backwards and forwards through email with other people. 
And that was an output, for instance, whenever I was uh, coming up to my one year uh, viva for my PhD that I had to do <laughs> to, to say, so what's the output so far? Well, I've been developing something and now hopefully I'll be able to get some data out of it. So that was um, one of the ways that I learned very early on that, yeah, going to conferences is a great way to get input from your peers without having any publishable outcomes as yet. Preprinting is a fantastic component of the open science, open research ecosystem. People often have concerns, as we've talked about already. I'm going to go to a conference and I'm going to present about my research. Am I protected? Should I be doing that? Well, one way that you can protect yourself is to preprint your yeah. abstract, maybe even your slides. And then you can add to that record as you go on towards the final publication. It's absolutely fantastic. You get that. Um, DOI, you get that CC license. What's a CC license, Maria? So it's a Creative Commons license, and there are several several types that you can uh, apply for. So, for instance, in most of the preprint servers, you can get a DOI, which is unique to your data set, and then you can say that this is a version, and I will make changes to it, and my contributors will make changes to it, but um, it's um, the people that can make changes to it are uh, those ones, and you can uh, limit, restrain the, the the contributors that can make changes to your data set or to your preprint. And you have a record on a preprint server, Research Square, BioArchive, MedArchive, PeerJ, yeah. to name just a few. People also ask us about, well, if I've preprinted something, won't that then be a problem for the journal when I send it to the journal at the final stage for that journal peer review process? And the answer to that is in increasing numbers of cases and many, 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 many journals like it if you preprint your work before you send it to them for final peer review, right? Maria, that's a stage that is just becoming more and more normalized in the research life cycle. And hopefully when you preprint, you get comments again yeah from the community, open peer review in action. Yes, so it's a lot of journals actually prefer it because if you print it, if you've uh, posted the preprint somewhere and you got some comments, that means that the community is actually engaged with your idea that it is noteworthy, that it has some sort of value to begin with. So journals like the idea that it's been, that the community is expecting uh, for the final version, because expecting the final output of that project that they're following. So one of our recommendations, going back to conferences and peer reviewing this potentially problematic corner of the research world, is for conferences to potentially partner with preprint servers, so that then all of the work is there, the community's involved, and people are looking at the work, peer reviewing it in an open way and of course it's also a great way to get your negative results out there into the wider world to get recognition for the work that you've done even if that's not leading to those nature and science papers with those earth-shattering change the world <laughs> results negative results and also clinical trials um and methodological work as maria was saying right like you've got yeah. like you've built up experience developing let's say a mouse in vivo model you can preprint about that, then you can share that knowledge with the rest of the community. That's really, really important. Maria? So, yeah, and it is important then that all of those facets of your, uh, of your path towards the publication, the ultimate publication, and why you chose some of the, some of the, the issues that you chose to, to go after and not others are clear so that even negative results are very important so that people don't spend a lot of time to replicate whatever you've done before and found no difference. Um, it is incredible the amount of times that I've been in conferences and I've seen presentations because there was nobody else to, to there was no other place where to present this that where people said, and I found no differences, and I found no differences. And I found no differences because that's equally as important 
in the path to where you're uh, going to. Sometimes you find you find a difference at the end of a very long road, and then you go off and explore that. But it's important that all of the other bases are covered before that. I mean, so our recommendations for conferences are going to be different to the recommendations that we would give for that final stage in the peer review process, the journal peer review stage, where peer reviewers are often put under pressure by journals and publishers to adjudicate on whether the research that they're looking at is a significant enough step forward to be published in this journal. And I've done this hundreds of times. You get instructions from the journal, often an email maybe from the editor or a form that you have to fill in at that journal peer review stage. One of the earliest questions, one of the first questions is usually, is this paper a significant enough step forward for publication in this journal? And of course, that's a very different question that you're asking when you're sending research results to a conference. So the kind of peer review will necessarily be different, but it still should be part of that whole research journey from an idea to the final published output. And so at Reviewer Credits, we are very keen and we would love to work with more conferences. So if you're organizing a conference and you'd like to get in touch, do do so. That would be absolutely fantastic because we can help you find reviewers, identify reviewers, and then reward them with the contents of our reward center for the peer review that they do perhaps for your conference. I mean, any final thoughts, any final comments on, on this conference peer review cycle, Maria? Um, I think it's very important, for instance, uh, to look at the size of the conference and the audience that you're that you're targeting whenever you will you submit an abstract to a conference you can uh, i think that the biggest i've ever been to was experimental biology and that's huge but i've been to conferences that are very small and i got valuable but different input from from the the two types so it um, is very Sometimes in smaller conferences, you get very targeted questions because everyone's much more specialized. And in bigger conferences, you get bigger picture uh, questions, which you should also uh, always, uh, you should also always uh, scope for in your in the paper that you're trying to to publish. Finally, it is good to figure out um, the types of people that you can network at the different conferences. So it's always good to have um, a balance of the two so that you know that where your research stands in the bigger, in the grander scheme of things, but also that you have a smaller network of people, of your friends and colleagues that understand exactly what it is that you're doing. And that network that you build up over the start and the duration of your research career, that network is your what we call a mentorship network. It's your group of peers, co-researchers, more senior and less senior people at different stages of their academic careers. But that's your group. And from that group, from that pool, from that mentorship network will come the peer reviewers for your articles when you send your articles to journals. So conference networking, attending conferences online and in person is hugely important because you get to meet, engage and interact with members of your network. And guess what? If you get asked by a journal, it still happens, not that often, but it still happens. If you get asked by a journal to recommend or give some suggestions for peer reviewers for your paper, which, by the way, you can always do in your submission cover letter anyway. That's a great idea. The journal might not use them, but put them there anyway. You can use people from your mentorship network, people that you've met at those academic conferences. You must have done this in your career, Maria. Yes, I got um, job offers and <laughs> other <laughs> and other uh, such through the networks that I built uh, over time. Um, and also because um, whenever you publish in, in an area, you get people reading uh, your, your papers and 
the questions, if you get back, if you get uh, reviewer comments, the questions will inform where you go next most of the time. At least they did for me. They informed what what was the uh, important thing, what, what was the interesting thing that I could look at next. And that was always something that I could talk to people about, that I could engage with, that I could... Uh, uh, I had to do a lot of reading on maths. That was not my field whenever I was first starting out. So I asked people and I asked uh, people that will probably review my paper <laughs> later, what do they think? Uh, am I doing the right thing? Am I going through the correct approach? Um, and that was always a good way to get, to get some feedback and to get um, some comments just on the idea. On the concept and uh, not so much on the results absolutely fantastic so conference is very very important for researchers and publishers please pay attention to how conference content is being peer-reviewed and we've provided some recommendations we're here to help at reviewer credits and do check out our reward center if you're listening to this and you haven't signed up yet as a reviewer on reviewer credits it takes just a moment you can do it just using your orchid ID. And then when you do reviews for journals, you get credits. You can spend those credits in the reviewer credits reward center. Maria, thank you very much for your time today. Great to see you. Bye. See you all again in the next <laughs> reviewer credits. Ask us anything. Have a great day. Have a great day. Best wishes.